everybody, we're live. Thanks for joining us with the Richard Listen Show, now at our new home, Hollywood Production Center. I guess you're getting used to us. We're moving around a lot, but I think we're going to like it Richard here. Richard is not getting used to it. <laughs> hey, I saw LeBron spot outside, so we're just going to camp out till we get him to come on this show. <laughs> or maybe Eva Longoria first. Someone in this building, please... You know, I'm just step gonna, up for us. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna hang out by the free Red Bulls or the Pac-Man machine. Maybe that strategy will work. Uh, today is an exciting day. We've brought in um, guests from different angles who help work with youth sports and youth leadership and entrepreneurship. So I'm excited. Kaylin's excited. I'm always excited. Uh, this week, we've had torrential rains in L.A., so it's been a challenge, but I got to be a part of my first, like, torrential rain soccer game, so I'm glad I grew up playing basketball. Isn't that amazing? I grew up playing soccer in the rain, you, you did it's you? fun. Yes, yeah, it's fun, fun, like, if you're warm and have an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting too spoiled, but uh, I'll be heading out to scenic Riverside, California, 16 fields side-by-side side this weekend, so... Um, Wish me luck. I'll be putting my coach hat on, so maybe uh, Lots our guests. Lots of orange slices, and, you know, right? <laughs> orange slices, and uh, I'm going to be carrying around the cooler. You know, it's I'm, I can't. I, the coach can't go too long without a snack either. Yeah. So today, uh, without further ado, we have uh, two guests here. We have, uh, who's thankfully, you know, a great example of how Instagram can connect you to people who are doing inspiring things. I'm not even going to give away his uh, his age because you're going to be amazed when you hear him talk. And uh, but we have uh, author of three books, violinist and entrepreneur, Mr. Itai Shahar. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Welcome, welcome. You're welcome, welcome. And then um, this is a purely selfish guest invite because I need help with my basketball <laughs> coaching. <laughs> I knew there must have been a reason why we have two guests today. You see, if you're looking for the method Shicey. behind my madness, if you do not suggest guests to me, I will uh, uh, ask for people who can help me with what I'm working on. So uh, we have the head of uh, head coach at St. John Bosco. No, 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 no. Director of operations for St. John Bosco. Director of o operations. He's also the head uh, of the SoCal Buzz basketball group program yes ages three to twelve third grade through twelfth grade third grade through twelfth grade thank you see and he'll Richard's help got his up his prep game huh? <laughs> <laughs> you too much going on in this brain 80 kids 80 kids in the program As of right now 80 plus kids okay 80 plus i was close i'm getting there okay <laughs> so we're going to get into uh how to help the youth of today obviously uh you know and what are you up to, Miss Caitlin? Well, I'm here, surviving the rains as well. Had a yes. crazy, quick, impromptu trip to Vegas this weekend. It was amazing what, what to was see. What's happening there? Energy drinks. Um, yeah, we were just checking out our cocktails, how they're doing out there in Vegas, and you know, just having some fun when I could fit it in. I mean, work fun, you know. But yeah, we're here. So we it's another Monday, another great new place. I love this new location with yes. two great guests. So let's get talking, right? Let's go. That's right. <coughs> That's right. So. Itai, three books by the age of 17. So, I mean... What am I doing wrong? <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell us. Well, um, I began my first book when I was when I was uh, 16. When I actually... Right around 15. When I... Because I, I encountered a lot of issues as a child and growing up. I, I suffered from a lot of them. But as I, I attended a lot of therapy and got a lot of help and whatnot. And so I just wanted to, I wanted to share a lot of uh, the problems and solutions from a different perspective and whatnot with, with everyone who's suffering with them because, you know, I, I understand, I feel the, the futility of trying to solve problems and trying to, and trying to overcome things, but just not feeling able to. And so my, sure that's something that everybody can relate to. Exactly. Right. So, I mean, everybody is able to, Every, everybody can relate to feeling despondent and feeling you know hopeless and whatnot but what I, what I try to do through my book is not only attack the problems from the surface but also build an underlying sense of confidence in your ability to really come back and really just believe in yourself more to take you from where you are now being problematic or to you know where you hoping to be now, did I read, too, that you wrote one book and then you kind of changed your strategy on how you were going to deliver the information from, is that? Right. I mean, I, I finished, I finished it. This one took me a year because I was just, my, I've never been a good writer per se. Just I've been, I just have the ideas really that I wanted to express. And so I felt like writing was the best way to execute that. 
and I I finished I finished the first one and I it took me a year and then the second one because I was already familiarized myself with writing my own writing pattern the nature of my writing and whatnot I was able to to really formulate a second one in virtually half the time like more like six months and uh, it's more it's not really like self help it's more so it's more so I tried to deal more uh, more with a philosophical approach to life like uh, natural theology, which is finding God through natural means. You know, some people have a, have a difficult time believing in something that they can't physically see. But there are, I mean, they're intelligent atheists, no doubt about it. So if you try really to, if you try really to connect what you're able to see physically to something that isn't physical, I find that to be a very, very interesting topic. And that's what I, that's what I discussed, you know, in long detail throughout the book. Yeah. So, but at 17 years old, I mean, those are very, I you know, know very complex. Profound. That we, now you, yeah. you, are you still in high school? Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. were doing that on the side. Yeah, <laughs> on the side. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yes. Coach, you're up next. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have no big words like that. <laughs> so okay, so and coach, you did you start out with basketball yourself when you were when you were did you play? Um, I didn't really play. Um, I just found myself learning a game, watching videos and reading, and decided to coach. I think I got into it for the wrong reasons. I think I hit it like me being from the in the eighties in high school. Some moms had like five year olds, so I wanted the coach to try to say the moms and I just fell in love with the game. <laughs> <laughs> I started for the wrong reasons. You both were incredibly honest with your first answer. Yeah. This is a good start. Huh? <laughs> We're not afraid. I mean, and thank you, Ita. Young people, I mean, maybe now in L.A., we're okay with, with going to therapy. But it's, you know, it's been a challenge when I would go out to a lot of the L.A. schools. I used to get called as a crisis responder. The, the challenge of getting help or when teens would want help, parents aren't always so open. Um, so was your family just really open to your journey and, and your story? Like, how did, how did you unfold? Because let alone to pursue a higher, you know, ordinate goal like writing, uh, or to go deeper into therapy and emotions. I mean, it, you, was, how was that facilitated? Uh, well, I my family's always been a strong advocate of therapy, particularly in the art of therapy. I mean, people I, I've had issues in my family that are not with me, and they've you know they they found uh, refuge in, in therapy and narrative therapy, and and they they found it to be successful. So I guess they wanted that for me. Uh, so they, they've always been an advocate for me going to therapy. But as for adolescence as a whole, I feel like parents, when parents don't necessarily tell the school or tell tell kids or t- tell the therapist or tell someone who's a source of help what's going on with the kid, I feel like parents uh, parents experience that, that it's a would be a breach of privacy to the kid in order to tell someone else that, oh, my kid is suffering. They'd feel like they're, you know, that... As as an as adolescents, I mean, it's it feels like okay, I'm no longer an independent, autonomous person by myself. I'm more like okay, I'm kind of forced to be here. I'm forced to be there, and I feel like that's that's the motivation behind parents not wanting to to send their kids directly to therapy. Um, they're, but they're respecting the the privacy the, of the kid because the kid. I mean, a lot of it's a very big struggle. I mean, it obviously comes back to the rooting rooting of parenting, which is that. It's do I what do I do that uh, do I do this do I be stronger? What is like, the best? Right? Exactly. Do I do I do I um, be the best parent or do I can I be the best parent I can by even though my child says no and he'll you know he or she will be sad or won't really you know won't feel the best even toward me which can kill a parent. And which and you mean this. initially though obviously or initially right and in the long term I, I mean generally speaking it, it usually plays out for the best. And but. I can, I'm going to interrupt and like, I totally relate to that because when I was young, my father, if, if the listeners, if you don't know my backstory, um, I w- my father was a quadriplegic my whole life and I became a caregiver at age five. Fast forward to age 12, he had very invasive um, bladder and intestinal cancer that took his life within a year. And so that was very traumatic for me and the adversity for my whole family. Wow. And um, that year after my father died, my mom would, was forcing me to go to therapy and I would not speak. I would sit in that room and I would refuse to open my mouth. So what you're saying is it's like, it's really like hits home for me because in that stage in my life too, my mom was trying to 
do what was best for what she thought for me because she didn't know how to help me heal. And so that was, you yeah, know, and, and but then in my position, I was so and, that's, that's against traumatic. it. But now, you know, in my adult life, I can say I've gone to therapy and found it very beneficial. So I think the individual needs to be open to the process in order to actually yeah. gain anything from it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely true from from experience now that I'm reflecting back. I'm noticing that I was initially reluctant and n- initially didn't even want to open up and whatnot um, for whatever reason. I just didn't feel I didn't feel like I, I was safe to open safe. up. Yeah, right, exactly. exactly. So, Something so who's, yeah. did somebody send you that cue, like that yeah, this is okay, or did you know, like someone go with you? Like what, what sent you that message that didn't make it like the opposition, right? You're talking about the teenage opposition that you don't want to you want to avoid that. Right. So I mean, I think it just came with age. I think it just when I was like significantly younger, um, I just it, it just it, my mom wanted to put me there, and I personally didn't see any results, and I didn't want results because. For whatever reason, I just didn't. I just didn't feel therapy was it was the right time and whatnot. I didn't see the right therapist, and but with time, I there was there was a point where I really hit rock bottom, and I was actually forced to see a therapist, and I just didn't put up uh, my my white flag. I didn't surrender, and I just acquiesced, and I just you know I was there and and did it. And then thank God it was with a great therapist, and I still see him today, and he is definitely one of the top in in the state. I don't know about any, I don't know about any any other extent, but I uh, I see him and that's and you know I've seen results and thank God that's yeah that says a lot yeah. that's a high compliment. Richard, do yeah. any of your people that you work with though feel do you feel like there's that wall? I was gonna say do any of my people say that I'm one of the best in the state? <laughs> 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 if, if you're out there, I can't disclose your privacy, but uh, <laughs> um, do well I start with adolescence but more people I'm working with are uh, look we're all (laughs) some of us we don't resolve thing in adolescence it's still something we're processing as adults so often what I'm getting is young adults in the workforce who then um, some of those things that haven't been worked through uh, are coming back up Uh, but I could definitely see going as a crisis responder this whole epidemic with uh, people want to hurt themselves and cutting things like that it was really beyond my scope because I had sports, I had basketball, I had an outlet. Um, so you definitely see what happens when people have a lot of emotion and they can't express it in the healthy environment and they have no outlet. So um, that's why I'm, you know, as much as possible advocating for people to find something where they can connect to other people. You know, if you don't love sports, uh, you know, if it's the Boy Scouts, if it's, you know, drama, whatever it is, it can get you connected uh, to other people. So, uh, and for a lot of people, they're not getting that, that need met through uh, the workplace or from school. It's more like a job and something you have to do. So, Coach, I want to ask you, Coach Burrell. Yes, sir. Yeah, so third grade to 12th grade. So you have some of this population that you guys talking about. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's fun. It's fun. It's a, um, when you get 10 different personalities on the court, it's, it's fun to watch. Like this weekend, my team won't start up until um, March 16th because I was a high school boys, but I went out this weekend to watch our babies play and to watch our 12-year-olds play. Our 13-year-olds won a championship. Um, just seeing the kids' um, energy they bring, um, the fun part. I mean, then when they lose, I mean, we thought we did lose a game this weekend, and then the kids with their heads down, but then you got to bring them back up, all the good stuff. So you take the positives, the negatives, and the kids, I mean, a lot of the kids, they just love being around us. They love being around us. Um they bring joy to me. I, I can't wait to get up, go to work, get out, get off work, go to practice, and here they all come running into the gym. So um, I'm at work from 7 to about 9.30 every day because I work at the school. We practice at the school. So only time I leave is to go get lunch and then to go home. Wow. So I really I really enjoy, enjoy what I do. Oh, you have an actual gym for your basketball, huh? Yeah, we don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, we don't play outside. No outside ball. No outside ball. It makes it tricky with the rains we just had. Yeah. No. So that, but that, you know, but that, here's an interesting question, though, right? Because so what? And and it's interesting your role being head of basketball operations as opposed to the coach, because when you see a kid, and and he loses a game, for instance, you get to see some of the emotional stuff that ha- comes up, and the coach is responding to the behavior as a team player, but maybe you get to see it like you know what's happening at home or what's happening off the court i mean is that on your radar i mean i know it's a lot of kids to track but no i mean I, one thing i try to do as a, as a director of the program um okay so let me let me fix this first so first i am 
director of basketball operations for St. John Bosco High School. And there I help run the events and all that good stuff um, when we do tournaments and um, showcase games. And then I'm the founder and co-director for the SoCal Buzz Basketball Club. So with the SoCal Buzz Basketball Club, um, I make it known to, it's, it's like, I have to know all my kids. I have to know all their personalities. I don't care. It's not how many it is. I have to know all their personalities, their backgrounds, where they come from. And because I have to deal with them and my coaches, I let them coach and I'll deal with all the stuff on the outside. So he might, we tell kid, we tell people, you don't know where little Johnny's coming from. You know, this is, you know, his life. You know, he goes back home. He has, he has this, 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 but then he's here with us and he doesn't have that home life. This is like, we shut it all out and I'm playing basketball. That's it. And then competitive, these kids are, the fire is awesome. But we tep- we try to separate the home life from the basketball life. You out here have fun. Um, our motto and our, our slogan is just hashtag buzz family because we take it more than just basketball. When we um, leave the gym, we're still a family. You can call either one of the, any, any one of the coaches and we have 14 coaches. Um, you can call us at any time, email, they DM us, you know, coach, I need help with this, this, this. So, you know, we reach out to help them and all that good stuff. So it's, we're more than coaches. That's beautiful. What's, what's maybe one or two things you do with the team to create that family? Hmm. That's the fun part. Because if some people come from broken family, they don't know what family uh, we looks do, like. Right? We do it all. We might have a pizza party at John's Incredible and then they come and eat pizza and they got the video games and everything. We do paintball, which is my favorite because I get mm-hmm. to go take out my son. <laughs> and, uh, and I get to find him to come out. Is um, he on one of the teams? He's on one of the teams. Uh-huh. I just don't coach him anymore because um, daddy don't know what he's saying. So <laughs> he plays on one of the other teams. Um, we do. Uh, we have done trips to Magic Mountain, Nasbury Forum this year. We go to Vegas as a team. We travel. Um, some kids, their parents can't go on the trips. So we'll rent three vans. We'll pile them up with kids. And it's a, when I say the family... It's really a family because from coaches, husbands, wives, cause we have a, we have some female coaches. Um, they're um, the wives. My sister, her, bro- my brother-in-law, my mother. My sister actually cooked in the hotel, made bacon, eggs, and pancakes for about fourteen boys that traveled with us one year to Vegas. <laughs> and it's really a family. These kids, they love each other. Um, in six years, um, since we restart, I restarted the program. We haven't had not one one issue. Knock on wood, but um, they respect the adults. They respect each other, and that's one thing we ask. You know, you guys are brothers and sisters, so it's yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and that's a good point because all these holiday the tournaments are over holiday weekends. So you know, holiday some, weekends. No, we're every, like, every if we weekend. wanted to play, we can play every weekend. But we choose to play twice a month. We don't want to burn the kids out. We give their family time. Their family time. We host our own events. Um, we host showcase. Um, we go, we travel. We used to travel. My kids that used to travel with me, they're now 10th graders. Um, we used to go to Portland, New Orleans. Um, we really got into it. Um, it's that we're trying, some of these kids, they gonna, they're gonna use this sport to take care of their families. And then there are some kids that are gonna use the sport to get to school and get the degree to take care of their families. So we're just trying to find the best option for the kids. And now you said you restarted this program after six years, or you restarted no. it and it's been going for six years. So it's been years going again. for six years. It's so, is there something that prompted you to want to restart this program? Well, um, so I have to take you back a little ways. And the buzz started um, maybe like 2007, 2008, and it was a minor league team. So, I was coaching a minor league team. We traveled to, um, what is that, Singapore. We played all over Canada, Mexico, um, all over the states. And in 2019, in 2009, in 2009 we lost uh, the ABA championship to um, Nashville, the, the Kentucky and Nashville. And when we lost, I just like, you know, I'm done with this. So I took the uniforms, folded them up, put them in storage, went back to high school. No way, really? Yeah. Then. So I met when a friend. did you get the the gig with the LA Sparks? Is that true? You were the you were the I got mascot? the gig. With, yes, I got the gig <laughs> with the LA Sparks in um, 2001. We were working. I was working out of the forum with the minor league team, and Michael Cooper, Lisa Leslie, and a couple of other ladies came to our 
middle school where I was a security guard at. And got to talk to Coop and everything. And then Coop invited me to practice. I told him I'm an up and coming coach. I went up, I could learn some stuff, came to practice. Wow. And, you know, how would you like to make some money? I said, doing what? They want a mascot. I said, dude, that's not I me. I read that. I wanted to ask you about that. I'm glad this is coming up. That's <laughs> not me. But when I realized, again, I'm going back to when, when I said I, when I fell in love with basketball. And I figured that, okay, the WNBA, what's going to be around? <laughs> There you go. His motivation. <laughs> but who am I? I'm in this big old dog costume. <laughs> they can't see my face. So I just, you know what? It was a great experience. I met a lot of people. A lot of people today that, that's helped me to make this program what it is today. Um, I've met um, just tons of people that helped me start this program off. So as I um, moved forward to high school, I met a gentleman, coached with him at Taft High School for a few years. Got to um, be an assistant coach to a couple of NBA guys, current NBA guys right now. Um, put about countless number of kids through college. Then we moved over to St. John Bosco, and that's where I've been for the last eight years. Um, I work with the football team as the equipment manager, and they're, they're a national top three team every year. And we get, I get to travel the country with high school football and more kids, just hanging out with the kids. The coaches are great. Then basketball, um, the coach we have now is freaking amazing. And then I just instilled everything I learned from St. John Bosco, which is an all-boys school, into my basketball program because last year I was a head coach at St. Joseph's, which is our sister school. And I took the brotherhood, sisterhood, and combined it, and now we're just massively growing every week. Kids are calling, parents are calling, wanting to join our program. Yeah, you know, this is this is amazing, Coach Burrell. And, and I just want to highlight something you're saying because you're being incredibly honest, but you're saying, you know, I got into it for the wrong reasons. But, you know, it, it there, there is something to – listen, there's nothing wrong with having personal goals. <laughs> and if you want – It didn't work. Goal, it didn't it, work. It you didn't know, work. that was your, like, uh, you know, pre-dating uh, app. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you put yourself around the and greatest frequency <laughs> of uh, opportunities for success. <laughs> You know, and, and sometimes, you know, right, our intentions, we don't get into it understanding what our longer term passion is with something. Mm -hmm. But it sounds when you tell that story, you can hear it like, you know, you were loving the people you were around. Those are, you know, whether, you know, former, you know, NBA all star like Michael Cooper or right, all defensive team, how many years, you know, or you getting around. You know, or you enjoyed you know spending time around women basketball players. Um, did you ever get any uh, numbers out of the deal or uh, from the WNBA players? Yeah, I'm talking about the fans. Oh, okay, oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make enough money to take them out. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Was I'm there a really was there a big negative for being the mascot? Was there anything that you really didn't like about it? Hot. Yeah. It was hot. Did, it was that, before, did it have fans in it? It was before the fans. Before the fans. Oh. Before the fans. Oh. So I'm in the back of the forum in the locker room like. The inside, like I had to take it and dry clean it because yeah, I would take I water and pour it all down. And you know, I went through gallons of water a day whenever yeah. there's a game. Oh. But it, it was fun. I mean, the appearances were the worst because it was hot during the appearances. But I mean, they made it worth my while. It was um, the basketball. I think the basketball in the WNBA and the NBA separates because it's. Um, I prefer the WNBA because it's um, the fundamentals. You know, there's not a lot of showboating. You know, and I want my kids to see, you know, let's play fundamental basketball. So it was, it's like that, yeah. It's um, for the wrong reasons, but making the right reasons. Yeah, exactly. I suffered in that costume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope well, the, guy, the, the guys who wear, like, the Phoenix Suns guys who have to wear the uniform and do, like, flips off the back. I didn't do any flips, no dancing, <laughs> you know, throw some, st throw some stuff out, meet the people in the, in the, in the stands, in the arena. Take some pictures, and that's about it. That's that's an added package. Yeah, but I didn't have to dance, flip, dunk, none of that stuff. So, Itai, what do you what do you say about you know um, in your book? Um, uh, remind me the title on the the first one is uh, here's a suggestion. Here's a suggestion. So, is it about tips to going after your goals? I mean, is it tell us a little bit about that and how that ties into finding your passion and um, well. I, there's there's a chapter I, I write uh, entirely about success. I mean, I, ironically, I didn't, you know, I was only 15, 16, and, and I'm, I'm still very young now, so it, it's not, I can't really write from massive experience, but, you know, to, to, to a smaller degree, 
like weight loss and, and things like that, I, I'm able to relate to, to larger concepts that are applicable in many different areas. So I, I do I do write a lot about that. And um, as, as for finding your passion and, and continuing to... Have you to been through major weight loss? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, no, last year was... Um, I lost I lost a lot of weight. And I'm still a thing on um, trying to burn off a lot now. But, uh, That's why I'll, we have these heat lamps on. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the infrared like sauna. <laughs> yeah, what do you say? Your, what is your, your sweat houses or whatever? Uh, what oh, is the it? sweat lodge. Yeah, That's the right. sweat lodge. We now have our lodge. own sweat lodge, thanks a, to Richard. It's a, it's a <laughs> transcendental I experience. I this hat, it's just going to fall all down. <laughs> <laughs> it's because LA hasn't been that warm. You know, we wanted to bring the warmth That's to you right. guys. Sorry. Yeah, um, so I, just, I wanted to mention something about what, uh, what he said. So he initially he mentioned about keeping basketball life and, and home life separate. And uh, there is a book by Dr. Phil called Family First, and where he parallels uh, having school as an escape and school as an outlet. And while having, you know, while being, uh, he's, he's one of several siblings that they were, you know, virtually homeless and they just had a really rough life at home. And, and in school, he used his friends and and all the and all the amenities the school offered as an outlet, really, to uh, to 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 get away from the troubles he's having at home. And so, I think basketball offers the same kind of consolation, and it's it's a very it's a very powerful tool, especially sports. And I think I can relate to that as a child being a caregiver too. And for me, yes, when I was at home, I was a caregiver. So for me, sports was my escape and my therapy because it was something I actively was passionate about for myself. Wow. Yeah, and it's it, it can be that healthy family, like mm-hmm. you were saying, where you get this experience of like, wow, I get to go on the van, I'm safe, I get fed, we have fun, even when we lose, it's okay, right? right. Even if you're competitive, it's like there's so much growth happening and mm-hmm. connection that it kind of replaces if there's you know pain at home or addiction. Or at least or, makes you, you know. um, forget maybe all the problems or the troubles for just that time where you're really or in the just moment. Escape, right. Yeah, you have that mindfulness in what mm-hmm. you're doing. And yeah, in fact, I was speaking the other day. Uh, my own kids asked me all the time about, um, you know, my I, I did not play college basketball. I had to go to work. And um, I had, you know, one healthy basketball coach who was like he was almost like a best friend and mentor and i really think that uh kevin kennedy if you're out there thank you um you know so you know that the the having a healthy one healthy coach even if the dynamic the team was toxic um very a lot of uh, infighting amongst the team so uh you know uh, hopefully not the same environment that i will create but you know that advantage of one person who is thinking of you in terms of how do i help you get through something or how can i help you become better for the next level whatever it looks like uh and sees what you're going through uh is just really powerful you know uh we can't all have the best culture or be on a winning program so uh you know those elements of you know, seeing the individual child, and maybe maybe sports isn't their realm where they, but but providing the safety for them to express that. I'm um, coach. Do you go through that? At what age do some kids drop off and say, "Hey, I can't take the travel and everything"? See, a good friend of mine is up there in age. Uh, I will say about 47, and we just went to Mexico last year to play in a 35 and over tournament, I don't think we ever give it up. These kids <laughs> nowadays, they want to be in the gym, they want to play. Um, they, I mean, it's today where you can go to school, be a lawyer, and then they have lawyer leagues. They have leagues for doctors, they have leagues for celebrities. So the kids continue to play, and they know that if I don't make it as a pro, if I don't go overseas, I still have this degree, if I go to school, and I can still find somewhere to play. They have the local YMCA's, so I don't think anyone gives it up anymore. I know our kids won't because the way we push them, and not say push them to be the best on the court, but to be the best all around. And I mean, I, like I said, I have 14 coaches. I have a, a staff of 15, 14 coaches and one photographer. And the, the photographer has a son on the, on the team. And um, all of us, we, I mean, we go watch the kids. We'll go in a group of like eight. And everybody will be in black and gold and hats and jackets and shirts and this and that. And we'll go watch one kid play in high school. And that kid is like, like stunned when he walk into the gym. 
I have to say, I love your gear. It's really fresh. Well, thank you. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, so it's um, it, they're not going to give it up. I mean, their their dream is they're going to be there. Continue with no matter where it's at. Whether you're playing adult league, you're playing in the NBA. I mean, I had a dream to play, and I wasn't good. I I mean, I stuck up the court and went to Mexico, and my boy like he was like, "Bro, what's up? Why you missed that layup?" I said, "How many times have you played with me in the last twenty years?" He said, you always been the coach. Aha. Uh-huh. Now you know why. <laughs> I do it for the fun. Well, that's important what you're saying. You're saying, you know, that performance goals are not everything. And as a coach or someone running a program, to be thinking about the process uh, or to be thinking about, yeah, like, I can't, you know, I'm still going to keep trying. Even, you know, uh, you know, uh, and it's like I still crave that level of uh, t- team camaraderie and being able to compete for fun. Uh, and that's what a lot of adult uh, youth rec leagues, in fact, I, in my, I used to play in the Beverly Hills Basketball League for like 20 years, and uh, Lisa Leslie would be there, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and I was always like, wow, well, you know, like, doesn't she want a day off? <laughs> uh, but just love being around the gym. Um, well, I have fun. one for you about Lisa Leslie. So when, we, when I was the, the mascot, I became friends with the players, and really their significant others. So we would get a, we got a team together and start playing, and the ladies would sit in the stands and watch us play. And they were like, the guys were like, "This is an adult league. You got WNBA players watching you." And I'm like, "Yeah, these are my friends." So uh, Delisha Milton Jones, who's um, the head coach at Pepperdine, they, her and her husband, will call me at like one o'clock in the morning, and it would be Lisa, uh, Nikki McCrimmon, uh, Delisha Milton Jones, and I'm talking about WNBA champions, gold medalists. And we're at Horseman Junior High School in the middle of South Central L.A. at 1 o'clock in the morning in the gym running up and down, <laughs> playing games, <laughs> three-on-three, awesome. three, four-on-four, whatever we had enough of. And I, I'll i be honest again, I think the men may have won zero games. <laughs> <laughs> zero games. I mean, it was just fun. It was, I mean, friends. Didn't look at them as WMA players, superstars, celebrities. It was just, you know, open the doors for the friends. We opened the gym up. At one o'clock in the morning, they will play, and then after they play, everybody go home, like it never happened. So, I mean, LA Unified can't say nothing now. This was years ago. <laughs> but yeah, yes, that's the beauty. I mean, if I'm so thankful for my local recreation center, like every holiday break, uh, every weekend, um, so that that safe space gives a lot of protection and resilience which I think is what we're talking about, what, you know, what the flip side is, you know, keeping from exposure to uh, other problems or other influences, oh, yes. uh, you know, like, like drugs and, and, and whatever else that could be pulling you um, towards conformity at that age. Etai, now you played the violin. Yeah, I was just going to say. I did mean, you know, I mean, I mean, how did you? Did a few you, years already, but. And you're a camp counselor? Like, how, who's <laughs> influencing your choices? Do you have a manager? <laughs> like, what? what? You making these know. choices on your um, own? I mean, this is not easy. I mean, you live in, you live near Beverly Hills. I mean, right. there's a lot of peer pressure. Yeah, Where well, from? there is. Uh, I've always, if, as for the violin, I mean, I want to attack each one individually. As for the violin, when I was when I was much younger, I was I just I heard the violin. I was always attracted to the sound and whatnot. Um, and so I, I my my mom didn't really initially want to get me a violin because they're like extraordinarily expensive. So it was just soon after I uh, after I expressed you know enough interest in she order tried for to it. give you the recorder or like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but I, I started playing it and you know after I grew I grew out size after size of violin out of four sizes uh, I was it, I was four years in and uh, you know my, my interest fluctuated but I, I just I always stay maintained and whatnot but after after you know, I believe four years it was I, I just I, I didn't want to continue with the teacher. I mean, I was I was really good, but I I just I didn't know some something in me. I just didn't want to continue with the teacher, and uh, I, I still play now, but not as not to the extent that I want to or as I used to. But I, I still was have. I was going to ask you: Is that ever memory, huh? was it ever an outlet for you as it is for you know like basketball? Yeah, is for definitely kids and- not. Maybe not. Maybe not to. Uh, maybe not to the extent that it that that it you know basketball provides, because it's more you know you're more immersed in basketball. But you can really be immersed in music. Um, but violin really uh, was it was it was more than actually just listening to the sound. It was you know people people liked when I played. It, it helped me socially, made me make friends, 
and uh, you made friends through violin. I mean, people appreciate it. And they're like, wow, that's are so cool. Are there traveling so. violin clubs? Like, they're <laughs> asking, is this a gig that I can get in on here? Can we? Can we? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. Just people, people were impressed by it, and I was, I just, I appreciate it. And people, you know, just when you have something cool, then pe- people just are, people just are just more attracted to you, you know. And it ha- kind of helps. And it kind of seeing helps some with similarity lot. with you and Coach right here. So you yeah. were also uh, hoping for some recognition and attention out of this. You're not afraid to admit that. Yeah, right? I mean, that's that's that's, that's definitely okay, right. Yeah, I mean, it, of course. I mean, everyone, everyone wants a sense of that. Um, you know, people, some more than others, but everyone wants their time to shine. Yeah. But the violin, I mean, that takes a lot of discipline. Was there ever like, um, a, oh, I should be out there, you know, kicking the ball? Or was there I don't pressure? Or you always had this individual, like, I'm going to go with what I, feels yeah. right to me? I mean, I, I always went with gut instinct, really. I just, I, I really... I liked I liked the violin, and you know I, I as I mean there's this there's entire this energy around violin about how it's so difficult and whatnot, but I mean I, I, I that's what I thought initially, but it really isn't it really isn't that hard to uh, to master and to really. Uh, really so you're do. gonna give us free lessons and <laughs> to improve this. <us. laughs> yeah, and, and and there's a lot of overlap in performance psychology between music. And sports like basketball, you know, if yeah. you, a lot of the research on flow, what, what coach was talking about being in the gym and just like hours go by and you're just happy and you're, you you couldn't, there's right. nothing else you'd rather be doing. There's no need to quantify it or, or think about time or, you know, where, where, where you need to be next. You're just in a total or enjoyment. In your own moment, right. Yeah, you're almost out of your body in a way and in this different space. Did you get that experience through music? Um not not as much as i not as much as i'm thinking now that i should have <laughs> i no i i did i did i mean I, d- I did get that but to an extent it didn't offer me it didn't offer me what what basketball would have done or any sport really would have done because i mean i just i mean tell me if you agree that it's you have to be friends before actually actually playing the sport with other people i mean myself i can go and shoot and, and make basket after basket but just i found that when i was playing in a game or when i was playing with other people with classmates or whatever setting would be i wouldn't perform even half as well as if i were if as if i were to perform alone you know it's just because of the pressure right because of the pressure and a lack of confidence and whatnot so i mean it's it's it, many i mean it's kind of counterintuitive because people would think that okay fine put your put your personal preferences aside who you like who you don't like and just go and participate but the reality is, is you have to be confident with one another. You have to be actually friends, and each each person has to have a role and be you know the backbone of the team, being able to rely on one another. Well, it takes you know, time. I mean, of course, you know, it takes time. Yeah. and that's something yeah. that when you mention the word experience, that that, that over time, and I'm sure uh, the beauty of getting to play so many games or so many right. tournaments it is that, that sense of I'm fidelity. sure that uh, you know coach can look with this co- you know how many times hey look I don't know if you videotape the games I mean at this level we get a lot of information you know look at that the end shot at the end of the game did you make the pass he was open you know what's going on with did you not trust it did you not see it uh, right. there's a lot to dynamics we can break it down um, so t- taking it from repeated practice into like execution in a like high pressure moment is is not just a you know a simple thing you could just flip a switch on um and, definitely not. and i hope that there's some patience for yourself with with all that you've achieved at a young age to allow yourself to to have repeated practice and grow into those connections because right. they take time uh, even perform. Yeah. Did you ever perform with a quartet or with a group or anything like well, that? Well, not not really. I mean, I performed at uh, a wedding and I performed at my own bar mitzvah. Really, <laughs> um, <laughs> your parents saved on entertainment. Did you, <laughs> 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 I to talk to your mom. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. No. So I I performed there and it wasn't really with someone else. It, it was with I performed with my teacher who is a, a great a great violinist. I mean, obviously has to be. But we uh, we played together and What's your teacher's name? Huh? Travis. Yeah. Great. Uh, he's a he's a great teacher. And that's the one I was with for those 4 years and we we played like we played great music and it just it sounded really good and everything was everything was good. So I mean, I I I did I did play it for a while and it was it was really offered me a really strong outlet. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. And what's your goal with with here's a suggestion your book? Who are you hoping to reach? I'm hoping I get I get I mean people ask me this frequently. I mean I 
I don't have a specific demographic I want to target. I I want to uh, I want to target every anybody who suffers from that problem. Obviously, you know, people my age typically don't suffer from uh, cognitive dissonance or things like that. You know, and it's just I, I want to target. Mean. Can you explain older. a little bit more what that means for right? So it's when you have the young, pe- the seventeen year olds <laughs> out there. So when you have it's it's when you're faced with two um, differing beliefs. When I when I want to. When I want to go here and do all these certain things, but at the same time I want to be religious and I want to do things that religion permits and doesn't permit and whatnot, and I'm just kind of stuck with this, with this uh, predicament, and I don't really know how to solve it, and so I'm stuck with these conflicting beliefs, and I don't know how to go about it. So that's the problem. Now, the opposite, which is I guess the solution, really, is cognitive consistency, where you're both, where I mean, all your beliefs are kind of congruent with one another, and you're really able to to understand where you stand uh, on those beliefs and whatnot. And so going back, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people, I mean, uh, really teenagers more so, I, I just, I don't know why I mentioned that example because teenagers actually suffer with that uh, a lot. So when someone says, I want to play basketball because I like meeting girls and I also like playing in tournaments, <laughs> it's okay. That's cognitive That's consistency. A good inference. <laughs> okay, okay. I just want to make sure I'm getting the concept here. Okay. So there's, there's no there's no dilemma. But if you say right. if I go play ball, but then my grades are going to suffer, then then that's dissonance, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. dissonance just means a separation. But as I was saying, I mean, I want to target whoever is suffering with that. If that's a forty-year-old suffering with happiness, I'm not sure that I'm able to even sympathize with a lack of happiness from a forty-year-old. But whoever is able to derive whatever whatever sort of uh, help they're able to do from the book, that's who I'm trying to target. That's what I'm trying to do. Amazing, amazing. Caitlin, you gonna get a copy or what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and 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 what do you have to say to people who don't have sports and are struggling with uh, finding identity or struggling with finding their own voice? Especially, you mentioned you know a lot of yeah. a lot of religious people, families where you're told what to believe. At a young right. Age. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, people. As for finding an outlet, you want to find, you want to identify exactly what's going on, what's wrong, exactly what's going on with the problem right now. For example, if it's uh, an issue at home, right? I Here is this problem and I want to dedicate whatever problem I, I have here. It's better to recognize the problem and then divert that the negative energy from that problem to an outlet. If that's basketball, if that's working out, a lot of people use working out because they're able to physically push through boundaries, which in turn kind of brings in their push boundaries in their head and whatnot. They're able to really make that correlation and then just, you know, as they're lifting a dumbbell, just to really understand, okay, I'm pushing through this and whatnot. They're really able to bring their bring their uh, anger to, you know, physical and creates fruition. positive exactly. self-esteem and self-efficacy. Of course, I yeah. can push this. I can lift exactly. this. Exactly. So I am just, strong, right? As opposed exactly. to what the environment might be teaching you, which right. is, right. So, the, I mean, like, I am strong. For example, that's, that's, a, that's a great, that's a great example you have that's a common denominator between the problem in your head i can push through this and you know physically something so that's so working out is definitely a a strong outlet but you have to find what you're good at i mean everyone's good at at something you know everyone is maybe it's not basketball i mean i was i was all right at basketball and i'm I'm mediocre uh skill wise (laughs) but uh but if for me it was violin and and art and sometimes architecture and whatnot depends depends uh my mood or what i'm feeling but everyone has their place they're able to to thrive and whatnot so that's what i would suggest very nice good stuff very nice coach do you do any work with your guys around identity or or you know outside of sports or how do you integrate like their their choices i know you're saying a lot of them want it to become uh, a future and and it becomes a part of their future um i mean every kid we tell them you know you choose your path i chose mine you choose yours because my, I mean, the, what I've, what I'm doing may not be for everyone, and it's pretty much I don't want to steer a kid in the wrong direction. So sometimes, I mean, it's like it, whether it's choosing schools, um, just make the right decision for yourself. Um, find out. We had one kid in high school. Do I go to um, UTEP or do I go to UCLA? Which degree holds more weight? You're from LA. You want to go down to El Paso, or do you want to stay home in LA? And I mean, he's living his dream right now. He's playing basketball, but and he has that UCLA degree. So you know, every kid makes their own decision. Um, you know, just little push the right way. 
Yeah. So, so what's that like for you, having people come to you with life decisions as um, well as basketball? I was going to say, can you relate to what he's been saying about you know having that be an outlet or having you know oh, no, one I of know. the kids may be mm-hmm. reluctant to want to play because of what's going on at home? I think all of our kids. I don't, we haven't had any kids that don't want to play because of what's at home. Um, they they what's at home is pushing them to play, pushing them to be better, to get out of that situation. If I can go to school and I can use this to go to school for free, and then my mom and dad can start worrying about money for me to go to college. Then if I go to the pros, now they don't have to run about anything. So I don't think it holds them back. I think it pushes them more on the court. Um, and I don't know. I think it's just different with my program because kids been with us so long that it's almost like a um, like a father and son with a lot of them. One kid, I, I tell his mom all the time, I adopted him when he makes it big. I just want the seats close enough to trip him. <laughs> um, but um, my son, those two are like buddies. Like Rick, Rick, they're the two best ones, like favorites. They always talking about each other, this and that. Uh, and they're night and day on the court. And so, but yeah, the home life, I think they take that and they put it all in and they channel it. And then when they go on the court, it's They're channeling it the right way. Yeah. yeah. I think I think I found one more of your reasons right there. Like watching watching your own son making friends in that way, right? And those bonds through basketball. Yeah, by him he's at, he has um three sisters, um three aunts, and it's like where are all the boys at? Then the boys start coming later and they're so young. So I believe this basketball program um is helping him also. Um he, now he has he has a bunch of brothers. Um, they talk to on the phone. They play on the on games online together, and then when they see each other, and one quick one. But back before they got into high school, it was always at the games. I'm looking like, why do you guys got two, three bags? Well, we're coming to your house this weekend, coach. <laughs> and I was sending the parents pictures of, and I had a one bedroom, and I was I was sending the pictures to the parents of the kids. Like one kid sleeping in the kitchen, one kid being <laughs> in the hallway. They're all over the place. And then in the morning, I would make I made um, chicken and waffles. And so the parents were like, "Tell them to enjoy it because when they get home, they're back to cold cereal." <laughs> so I mean, it was so it was more than just basketball. Like these kids, um, I look forward to hanging out with the kids. Um, I think I do it. I let's just say this basketball is about to take a back seat. I just got engaged. And she's, kind of thinking, and she's kind of pushing yeah. like you know you work a whole lot you work a whole lot but the reason I'm working a whole lot now is because I have a wedding to pay for <laughs> yeah. but um I mean well, she's I was going to ask that, that right because that was a, like how, how do you keep that balance and so that's beauty it's, that a relationship sends a message right yeah, it's hard um with my program then I have the school and then when I don't have the school my program I just took another job with another program as a director for a girls program uh, for a shoe company and it's like, babe, we're gonna have time. Like we went to a late movie last night, and as I'll so have that time. you always make time for what's important, yes. right? That's yes, right. I'm trying. I'm, so I'm learning. That. You're gonna I'm have learning. a lot of subheads of delegation. Make time probably. for what's important. <laughs> a lot of phone calls to hint, Janet hint. to help me out. Her. <laughs> what's good? Right. I, need help. I need help. Well, but um, <laughs> I'm trying my best. But she believes in the program. Um, she likes the program. Um, her son was a big time basketball player. Um, oh, so she understands your. She passion. understands the travel ball, all that stuff. So she's used to sitting in the gym. I used to sit in the gym long hours. I would get to the gym sometimes at seven a.m. and I'm leaving at seven p.m. But that's just in the gym, in basketball only. So um, my coaches enjoy what they're doing. Um, most of my coaches, two of my coaches have kids in the program. Next, besides myself, so that means everyone else has no kids in the program. So they they they're doing it for all the right reasons. Yeah. So. Well, Coach, we just have a few minutes left. So yes. Give us more info how to get a hold of SoCal Buzz and you. and, and, uh, and um, then, you SoCalBuzzHoops.com yeah. has all our inf- contact information, has information. Um, we just did a commercial, so there's a little commercial up about us. Um, but SoCal Hoops, SoCalBuzzHoops.com. Okay, Instagram or Twitter Instagram, handle? SoCal, everything is SoCal Buzz Hoops. Perfect. Okay, and thank you so much. And thank yeah. you for having me. Thank you. Itai, how about you? What are you up to, and how can people get a hold of you or reach you? Uh, well, you can find my book on Amazon. It's uh, just type in either my name or uh, here's a suggestion. Spell it for everyone, please. <laughs> uh, my name is it's Itai Shahar. It's E T A I, and then uh, Shahar is S H A C H A R, and you can find that on Amazon and um, 
uh, most of my books will come up there. And but if you wanted to find the the one I'm working on right now, you can type my name in. Or here's a suggestion is also available there. Here's a suggestion, okay. But you know, it, will it apply to me? Of I'm course. in that forty year old demographic. <laughs> you're talking. <laughs> That's okay. Don't be afraid to learn something from the youth of, of today. It's okay. He's seventeen. He might know. He might have wisdom we haven't accessed yet. Yes. Caitlin, what are you up to? Yes, yes. Um, trying to figure out how to buy time and sleep. But other than that, you can find me in the normal places. CaitlinPatriciaWeiler.com and KitKate on Instagram. Okay, everybody. We are back in a mm -hmm. few weeks. I will send pictures. Hopefully, pray for no rain on the soccer fields this weekend. Where are you guys at? Uh, Riverside. I'm going to San Bernardino this weekend. Oh, really? Well, beautiful fields. It's right next to a trash dump, but it's as beautiful. <laughs> we, create, we create beauty in our minds, everybody. So <laughs> we will Photoshop that out. Uh, we'll be back next. We'll be having another American Ninja hopeful and personal trainers and former collegiate athletes, uh, Garrison Reese, collegiate basketball player, and Deontay, uh, who will be back talking about uh, his college football days and celebrity training. So thank you again for tuning in. Once again, Richard listens on Instagram and Facebook and keep sharing it if you like it and share your tips, suggestions for guests. Thanks for tuning in. Take care, everybody.